Yeah, welcome to uh, Fun and Chat Hour, and we're interviewing Gary Tustin, who you may have heard, uh, another Finland-based character. Um, and how long have you been living in Finland now? Oh, I've been in Finland now for about 10 years. Yeah, 10 years, nearly 11 now. 10 years, cool. Yeah, not long. Yeah, I've been about 10 years as well, so 2011, we yeah, so yeah, two, I was sort of 2011, late 2010. So yeah, about the same time, really. Yeah, somewhere near. Yeah. Okay. Um. So tell us a little about yourself and what? Who are you? Who is Gary Tustin? Who is Gary Tustin? So, Gary Tustin is I'm I'm sort of like Shrek. I'm like an onion, that because onions have layers, and there there are many layers to who Gary Tustin is. Uh, there's Gary Tustin, the children's entertainer, Gary Tustin, the radio presenter, uh, children's book writer, event host, uh, actor, and very bad singer, to name but a few. I'm sure it can't be that bad. It, it's, uh, well, I right, okay, here you go. Engelbert Humperdinck said I could sing. <laughs> Straight up, I I sang in front of Engelbert Humperdinck, and he said I could sing. So it somewhere along the line, there's a compliment, especially if you like Engelbert Humperdinck. Oh. He's got a, a a big fan base, so yeah, the bloke that changes his name from Jerry Dorsey to Engelbert Humperdinck. Well, everybody knows his name, though. Exactly. Where are you from then? You're not from from here originally. Obviously, you came here ten years ago. Where 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 do you actually hail from? No, so I'm like my wife calls a blow in. That's mm. what we're called apparently in Fenman terminology. We're blowings. Yeah. So I'm from Cheltenham originally in Gloucestershire. Okay. Yeah, been there a few times. It's it's, it's very a nice, nice place. It yeah. is very hilly, which makes a change from here. <laughs> It's fun if you like um, beer and horse racing. Uh, which I pretty much, and I enjoy the beer. The horse racing, not so much, but they've got some few other things. They do quite a lot of festivals and lots of the arts and it it's quite a very engaging town. Mm. Yeah, it's been... Been a few years, but yeah, I've been there a couple of times. It's uh, yeah, it's a lovely, lovely part of the countryside. Definitely. I mean, I mean, I've lived all over the country uh, <laughs> with my job as a holiday park entertainer. It's taken me to literally every coast in the UK. I've sort of worked my way around, and Cheltenham's lovely. March is lovely, and I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to Newcastle as well because I, I had a great time up there. Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely place, and that's the, that's nice when you actually get the opportunity to go and actually spend. Uh, a, a decent amount of time at each place as well, so you don't just go through the sort of like the touristy bits. You actually get to understand, also get to see all the the local the ins venues, and the ins and yeah. outs as well. So, what made you actually come to the Fenadine? So, way back when, I went to the Searles Holiday Park in Hunstanton. Mm -hmm. I was the assistant entertainments manager there. And uh, while I was there, I met my wife. Um, one thing led to another and I decided that she was worth sort of packing in the journeyman holiday park lifestyle mm -hmm. and settling down. And she lives in March. She's born and bred. So here I am. We're 10 years down the line and little one of our own to add to the four that she already had. Yep. And a very busy house. Yeah, I can imagine. So when you say that you were you, you were doing the shows and you were travelling, so does that mean you were going from one camp to the next sort of... So it was seasonal. Right. So I'd, I'd go to, say, Hunstanton one year, and if I liked it, I'd stay there. If not, then I'd move on to somewhere, say, Hastings. And then I'd... Go to Bournemouth, Brighton, uh, Yarmouth. So you were uh, there for the whole season. Cornwall for the for the whole year for like a year. Yeah, 
And some parks I was at for more than a year. Some parks I was at for a lot less. <laughs> it, some areas I just didn't get along with. But mm-hmm. I won't do that at risk of offending anyone. But some, yeah, some areas of the country are absolutely beautiful. Re- and if uh, any advice I could give to my kids would be fly. See, see as much as you can. So where would you say was the best place that you actually stayed? Or if you chose to go back to one particular venue? If I chose to go back to one particular holiday park, it would be a park called Harlin Sands in Cornwall. It's near Padstow, mm-hmm. uh, not far from Newquay. And it is beautiful. It's a little private park with its own little beach. Nice. And... You can get up in the morning, see the sea, and no, you, you can't you can't go too far wrong with such su- nice sandy beaches and a mm. nice clean sea. Fantastic. Yeah, it's always nice to to smell and and hear the sound of the sea. Definitely. Yeah, I, I grew up on the, the 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 coast, and yeah, I must admit, being in in Finland, being so far away from the coast, I do miss the uh, the sound and the smells. And the fish and chips. <laughs> Indeed, the fish and chips is definitely a treat. We we go down to Hunstanton a mm. lot. We we enjoy going down to Hunstanton. It's a nice little seaside and just the combination between the the smells and the the sounds and the the um, the pier and the the candy floss and the, the arcade every, you know, everything and the all ice just comes cream. together. It all, and is it, it all just stuff? merges nicely? Yeah. You decided. You moved here. You said you gave up your career effectively in um, entertainment yeah um and you came here you settled down um so what did you do or what made you go back into um entertainment what made me go back into entertainment well i got a job at blockbuster well the video yes the vi- <laughs> blockbuster video store so when I came here, I got a job in Blockbuster because obviously you you need to work, you need to have a job, you need to pay your way. And we all know what happened to Blockbuster. Well, do you want to, do you want to just tell some? Because I'm uh, sure some of, yeah, the, some of oh, the audience are quite young and they probably don't even, re- haven't even heard of Blockbuster. Not heard of Blockbuster? Oh, no, that's missing out, walking down the aisles. Well, also, some uh, and half our audience is in America as well. So. Oh, well, they... Well, they're Blockbuster, yeah. They're, yeah, they, yeah, they have Blockbuster they do. in America. I'm just definitely. thinking, like, yeah, because I remember watching Marvel, Captain Marvel. Yeah. Yeah, because she's in... She, she go, went she to visited Blockbuster, yeah. yeah. She fell through the ceiling yeah. and wasn't Sylvester Stallone the Terminator in that one. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I worked in Blockbuster, which was, for our younger listeners, a video rental shop. I think they... They did do DVDs. They went but on it did to eventually. They, they did eventually just... go to DVDs. Yeah. And you could hire out computer games and all this stuff as well. And unfortunately, the company went bankrupt. It went under. So I I sort of found myself in need of work. And there was there's a pub in March called George's. And its landlords, a gentleman called Nigel Marsh, uh, offered me a position as the entertainer entertainment's uh, coordinator so to speak so i ran the bingo it was my job to do the quizzes uh get people in for karaoke get bands in so on and so forth and as i got back into sort of the entertainment's management side of stuff Mm. i got the niggle so it was more a case of you went back as a management sort of organising it yeah. as opposed to just actually being the, the presenters and performers. Yeah, and I I got the niggle because I, I never lost the bug. I sort of settled down to be with my wife and so it was a case of I, I want to be with you so I'll put it yeah. to one side and then all of a sudden the little that little itch... Mm came back that that little sort of performing side of things kicked in so luckily march has its events Mm. and it started off with 
the first uh, St George's Day I got in actually involved in, I wasn't officially involved in. Mm. So they had a parade going through the town and Nigel decided to set up a speaker with a microphone. And I was comparing as people were walking through the town, running out, chatting to the people in the parade, like you see on like the t- news reports and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And so it caught people's imagination. So once I'd done that, yeah. they were aware of what I could do. You got into entertainment through by accident, kind of, sort of semi by accident. Semi semi by accident. I sort so, of I I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And then there's a company in March called Twenty Twenty, mm-hmm. and they were looking. They they work with kids. Uh, the youth, mm-hmm. and they were putting together a radio station. And I've always wanted to get into radio. And so, not knowing at the time that they worked with just, with they were primarily a youth-based organisation, I went along saying, yeah, are you doing a radio station? Do you need a host? And they were like, no. <laughs> uh, but, in doing that, I, I sort of chatted with them and made friends with them. And they also helped me sort of find my way back in, sort of connections and so on and so forth. Mm. Well, I must admit, I mean, I've I've worked with 2020 as well. And they gave me the opportunity, even though it's based primarily for, for kids and, and, and youths. 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 <laughs> Is that, is that the, the end thing now? The Utes. Um, the they, bad Ali G impression. <laughs> brace yourself. But that was that was the main drive, obviously, for yes. for, for young for young adults and young people to to um, in theatre and arts. But it also gave uh, quite a few adults the opportunities to mm. to get involved, to either help out or to to gain some experience. And for me, it was the I went there and said, "Look, I want to do some. I've done some script work." And they said, can you write us a comedy? Can you do us a sitcom? And I went, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> <laughs> I had never written a sitcom or any kind of comedic. I'd done some drama-based scripts, yeah. but I'd never actually done any um, any comedy-based. And I thought, eh, how, how, how hard is this? <laughs> but they gave me the opportunity. I mean, mainly it was basically just to create something that gave the, the kids something to actually go and work with yeah because they were doing the camera work they were doing the sound they were doing the performancing the costumes the set design they just needed some material to actually work with from what i remember it took off as well though didn't it It did yeah we had had four four or five episodes um until it sort of i think it just fizzled fizzled out because people a lot of people left for university and sort of the main core sort of they just the main devolved. castle grew yeah. up, yeah, yeah. So it just sort of devo- dissolved, and it was it was a great opportunity at the time, and it kind of gave me the confidence to go off and do other things. So yeah, my, Mark, um, twenty twenty have have been an, an an important part in I think a lot of people's play um, yeah. lives in, in the Fenland area, young people and old fogies like us. Yeah. So. What was the the next step then? What, where did you go from there? Once you sort of did you go into? Could you go into radio at some point? Did was I, that straight away from that, or was that that wasn't straight away from that? So with with twenty twenty, I helped with the youth theatres, and while I was helping out with those, I like I said, I wanted to work in radio, so I started searching online. Mm. And there's a radio station called Huntingdon Community Radio. Yes. And I contacted them and said, look, I've got this free time. I'm interested in working on radio. Can you help me out? They got back to me. And for about a month and a half, I sat in on shows with a gentleman called Ivor Sanderson, Mm -hmm. who hosted one of their morning shows at the time. It was 10 to 12. And eventually he let me participate in the show. And it slowly started working on from there. I then got a drive 
the before drive time show, so sort of the school run mm. type of show. So I I was doing that on alternate weekdays. So three days a week, I'd go down to Huntingdon, do the show. And I did that for about three years. And they were, they were fantastic. They were really helpful. They taught me how to use the operating systems and speak clearly on a microphone, which, yes, I know how to do, but speaking on a radio is microphone a, is, a different is thing. a completely different beast to yeah. chatting on a stage microphone. Yeah. Because if you talk on a radio microphone the same way you would on a stage microphone, you'd just come across muffled. Mm-hmm. So it, it was really good. Re- uh, fantastic little experience and lots they've got so many experienced djs as uh radio hosts they and they were all quite happy to just impart wisdom Hmm. yeah so i got to actually be on no on your show but certainly be able to sort of watch one of your shows so i still got that video somewhere (laughs) you it's up on your page it is yeah but just to sort of actually get to watch you and how you go about you know the preparations that you went through so we basically followed you for the for the day and watch you sort of going through the um say the preparation the uh choosing the music and then sorting everything out and uh, sort of very much behind the scenes of of how you actually go about it so that was quite an eye-opener yeah because when you listen to a radio show you don't I don't think a lot of people understand how much work goes into the setup mm. of the show. And you you do get, I mean, if you listen to certain radio stations, they seem to play the same songs mm. over and yes. over and over again. They use a tape, don't they? For They have like a set playlist for yeah, each day or a, every other day. And so that was the good thing about HCR. They gave you the chance to insert your own personality Mm. into the show and so you could go in an hour early and you could put in the songs that you wanted as long as they were within their remit of 60s 70s 80s and so on and once you've done that you've got to figure out what you're going to say what competitions you're running independent of the ongoing competition because being a radio station it has its flagship competition yeah and i decided that in my show i was going to do a silly competition as well where you could win a lollipop and it, it just a silly little prize and all you had to do was answer this really ridiculous question mm-hmm and the question would be something like, how long did the Hundred Years' War last? Not 100 years. Nope. Or About 120 years or something? It's 136, oh, I there we go. But, uh, you're <laughs> I probably it's not... <laughs> people telling me I'm wrong on that one. But it's like, what is a camel hair brush made of? I not camels. Not camel hair, exactly. <laughs> and I love questions like that. Uh, the, just the ones where you think the answer is obvious, but it's not, and... It just kept people on their toes, but it also means that you've got to put a little bit of thought into the show. Yeah. How how long do you do? Because you, you you don't do um, radio anymore, do you? But so you did it for a while. No, I I did it for about three years, and then it was clashing with the work I was doing with Twenty Twenty as I was becoming more involved with them. Uh, they asked me to do a radio show which was written by a certain young promising writer from what I from what I remember um, who, who who's that oh, I can't remember <laughs> oh, my, my memory is getting a bit foggy now but yeah they 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 did us we we did a film to start with uh which was brilliant but it was I, I find that 2020 was taking up more of my time mm. and so I had to put the radio show onto the back burner and eventually I just didn't get time to get back to HCR. Uh, recently, I was a host on Smooch FM, mm-hmm. uh, which was a completely different animal because it was 
a pre-recorded show. So it was all, I could do it at home. I could record the shows. Yeah. And then I'd just send them over because the computers were linked. It was running off like, it's like a cloud system. Hmm. And once you've recorded the show and locked it in, it just goes bosh, off you go. And it's there to be, go live when... When it's set to. When it's set. But of course, the difference between a live show and a pre-recorded show is on a live show, you can say, call in, let me know, give me a show tape. On a pre-recorded show, it's like, uh, here's a fact. Yes. <laughs> here's, here's something, here's a bit of information which you can't interact with. And so what I found myself doing was setting uh, competitions and questions for the following week. So Please. listen to the show and during today's show, tweet in what you want me to go on about next week. In the next week. week. Yeah, I was going to say, obviously, if you, you have interaction with the audience, it's very difficult to do that when you are recording. A show in advance. Yeah. And So uh, how, how long before the show would you actually record it then? I So I would go out on a Saturday and Sunday and the show would be three hours long each day. And when I was doing HCR... I'd be in the studio for an hour before the show, do the show, and then off home. Mm. And that was pretty much five hours of my day. Doing smooch, it was literally 40 minutes. Because all you're doing is recording the links. Yeah, you're not doing all the bits in between. And, and, you, and you literally record a link, listen to it back, save it, move on to the next one. And once you've sort of got scripts there of what you're going to say in a way of plugging yeah. it and playing it, you just flow through. So all the news, the adverts, the music, everything sort of... So you're it, just doing the just bits in between. In there. And you can take out songs and put in songs as you wish. Mm. But if you didn't want to do that, you could have an entire three-hour show recorded in 20 minutes. Yeah. And you'd do that a couple of days before send it off and it's there but in today's so society where everything's so interactive everyone wants to interact and so it didn't feel right mm. i i like interaction i thrive off it it's one of the things which is probably getting me in the most trouble <laughs> with a lot of things i do i prefer to be interactive rather than just talking at people so yeah i suppose it's it's the nature some people like to just be on their own and just talk on their own and and you got others who want to have like a oh is it a zoo kind of radio is it, is it zoom ra- zoo radio is that sort of the description you had where you had the presenter and you had uh, a group of other um, um assistants that, that people interacting with you and yeah. banter and all that sort of stuff yeah that became very popular in the sort of the 90s and early 2000s oh Chris Evans and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Simon Mayo. So sort of having everyone all clapping in the background. <laughs> You've obviously gone back into radio. Is it something that you would like to do more more of? Yes, definitely. Um, but once again, it's something I've taken a step back from again because both HCR and Smooch are voluntary. Mm. Um, I'd like to get into it in a paid manner. I went to a station, an online station, but it was an online station for a betting website. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) they basically, you had your generic bets for racing, sports events. Then they had their bingo. Yeah. And that was running on constantly. And then in the background, they had the station. Yeah. And so you... It, you read the it was literally live chat people were chatting with you as you were hosting whilst you're also letting them know about news bets promotions and all that sort of stuff hmm. unfortunately that was in milton Keynes. yeah a bit far away and they wanted someone closer yeah which was a shame because i could have done the commute i could have done that that would would have been quite handy and they 
had people like Tony Blackburn hosting four of them and stuff like that. So I, I want to get into radio, but I want to be able to do it for a living yeah, rather than as a hobby. Yeah. Funny, it was talk- when we were talking to Rick Savage, I mean, he started off in hospital radio. Is that something, again, it's all voluntary. It's and it's, voluntary and again. That's, that's and hospital a- radio, you don't see much of anymore. No. Uh, Peterborough City Hospital had its station. And now I do believe where the station was, they have ticket machines. Okay. Because I know that uh, Cambridge used to have theirs as well. So I, I don't know. I if... don't know if they're still going, but they were, they were certainly... Because um, I, I got to be a guest on one of the shows. so Ooh. And that's down in the basement as well. <laughs> I I loved... I tell you what, I love those sorts of things. When I... Hospital radio, all the small sort of local... In, inside things to like a business or something like that i mean when i was at pontins i was blue coat and they had ptv which is your own tv channel okay so pontins television a small (laughs) network their own little network in-house network pontins tv do you want to just explain for obviously a lot of our audience as i said is, is from outside the uk do you want to just sort of explain what the holiday camp and the pontins because I don't think many other countries have. I tell you what, that's a dream of mine to take the UK holiday camp experience abroad. I I think it would just go down a storm in somewhere like America mm. or somewhere like the south of Spain or south of France. You get that. So, yes, let's explain. Um, the UK style holiday park is very much where you stay in a chalet-based accommodation or a caravan, touring caravan, and you wake up every morning, there's a kids' club. Uh, You take your kids along and there's um, games, competitions. Uh, You can... There's always nearly a mascot there, whether it's Captain Croc or... Buster Bunny or something in the Billy theme Bear. of something in the theme of the the mascot of the the camp or the, yeah. the company that and runs they're, it. They're like the hero mm. of the camp, and everyone's encouraged to join in. Mm. Everyone's encouraged to cheer, be happy. You have your entertainment's team, which are people who wear very bright clothing, whether it's. Uh, with Pontins, it was a blue coat. Butlins, the most famous of the lot, is your red coat. Yeah. Um, then nowadays, you've got places like Park Holidays where their entertainers wear very snazzy black waistcoats with pink shirts. Nice. It's very... It's. But it's a very much on brand, so every yeah. every company has its own specific colours. Yeah. So it was almost like yellow coats, red coats, blue coats. So they were very distinct, so every company had its own brand and colour. Oh, yes, and... Butlins being the original, the red coat was the dream. Luckily, I got to work for Butlins, uh, but I was never a red coat, which is a shame. I was an I was an entertainer, but it was for the Grand Hotel Margate. So uh, I suppose it, in some ways it's almost like the Disney Club. It is it's the British version of what the Disney Club kind of ethos is. Yeah, it, it's it's all about everybody joining in together. Yeah, so it's not just the kids; it's Very the adults and the families and. The- togetherness yeah and it's silly and it's fun and it's about just relaxing and joining in there'd be swimming competitions at the pool they'd be chasing an entertainer around dressed as a pirate before throwing him into the pool custard pies um this is all in the daytime knobbly knees is that still is that still old school (laughs) And then you'd go to the evening and there'd be bingo. There'd be your chance to, for the boys and girls to get up on stage. Mm. Your compare would play games. They'd get the children up on stage. You'd pay attention to the children. Talent shows where the kids would get to show off what they can do. The entertainers would then get up and do their own show. Or you'd get a cabaret in, a magician, a ventriloquist, a singer, a comedian. And... These people were heroes Mm -hmm. and they're there just to entertain and they'll shout out to the audience and they'll expect the audience to shout back. Participate in the the activity. And the the audit, 
the sad thing about holiday parks is that's now changed in the UK. Oh. Um, unfortunately, people are very much used to being on their phone. Yeah. People aren't you. People aren't as keen to interact. They're more concerned about their image. Yeah. How they're seen. If they go up on stage and look silly, is someone filming that and putting that online? Yeah. And so, in countries where you're abroad, where you're away from that social stigma, I think it would be more. You'd be more relaxed. Mm-hmm. And so I'd I'd love to see that in America because. You see, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Americans that are listening to us, but you guys seem to be more up for a laugh, more up for joining in and cheering. Being part of the... Being the, part of the actual entertainment. Yeah. I know they have a lot of uh, summer summer camps. They yeah. they're, they're have more of a sort of um, an experience where everyone goes to for the, the summer and they go into the wilderness or... So they do have similar kind of things, but it's more geared towards the kids... Or the the teenagers, yeah, as a sort of your peer group. Whereas the holiday park is more about the families. family bonding, yeah. family bonding with each other, and then also families bonding with other families. Mm. And of course, the other extreme, we should take it to Spain. You get the beer all inclusive, and suddenly people are a lot more willing to join in. Anyway, so yeah, that that's the sort of holiday park. I mean, it was, it was Pontins. I think was it um, Skegness was the first Ingermells. Was that the first one that was made? It was either that or Blackpool. I, honestly, Butlins, I don't. Butlins Minehead. Minehead is it? Minehead was the first Butlins, and that was the the first one that was um, created by Billy Butlins. Billy Butlins, who yeah. then who created the idea, the ethos of of getting people. Uh, families to go away on holiday because they'd only just started doing summer holidays because yeah. before then there was no such thing as ho- holidays there he, was no he strategy created leave. like a hol- that holiday thing experience yeah because you had factories eventually started when various acts came in and they had to people were told they had to have a holiday period of two weeks and they would shut down all the factories for two weeks and then so they started to go to places like Blackpool and, and Skegness and various other um, seaside resorts. Yeah. And then obviously the opportunity was then to create something where people would go to. So it wasn't exactly. just a case of just going to the beach. It was you go to the beach and you'd have this experience. So they had the trains. So the trains would bus- take them out to to these places. So they would all decant on mass and then go to the holiday homes. I, and- I remember that we'd have to meet the coaches as they came in mm. to the park. So you'd have the people that came in on the coaches and people that came in by their cars, because obviously this is the noughties now, people. It wasn't so much on mass and Billy, but we were still there. We were still greeting them and we were setting the standard straight away yeah. that it was, you're on holiday now. Yeah. This is all here for you. We're here to entertain you. You're here to have fun. Yeah. It's a wonderful experience. And if if you want to know what a holiday park was like at its height, watch Heidi High. Mm. Which is one of the best 80s sitcoms ever. Oh, it's fantastic. But also, it is actually very accurate to mm. what holiday parks used to to be. But run but seen through the eyes of the the management yeah. and the, the organizers. Seen through the sight the eyes of the entertainment team and i tell you what that that's what i'd love to bring back mm. that's what i'd love to i'd love to bring that back in the uk but i don't feel that attitudes are up for it but i could i'd love to take it abroad definitely you did a bit of film work i did a bit of film work what, what did you do then what was what was your, your film work what was my film work well i was in a film called home from home what's that about then What's that about? You 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 sound so suspicious then. It it's a World War Two based film about the refugees moving to the Fens, and it starred the kids from Twenty Twenty with the actually the Chatteris Youth Theatre Group, and 
I was involved. I was... They told me I was a director, but nobody listened to a word I said. So uh, I also got... Oh, a yeah, little... standard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's very true. I got, I got a little acting part where I got to wear a very tight-fitting costume and played a little bit of um, Dad's Army on that one, I think. And... So, so that whetted your appetite to go and do a bit more acting. Yes, well, I'd, I've been on, been in TV and f- TV certainly before. When I was younger, I, when I was at university, I was in Biker Grove. And really, I, I've been in Casualty. Yes, not <laughs> not literally <in> Casualty. <laughs> casualty, although I have on the, t- on I, the TV was, series. There's a TV series called Casualty, and I've also been in that so so did you get to meet pj and duncan then no unfortunately not i was filming on location and Ah. i i was a drug dealer (laughs) i was yes i was selling bags of sugar mud (laughs) there you go so if you need sorting out with sugar and mud just give me a shout so uh, were you responsible for Ant McParlin going blind then? No, I, <laughs> bad, I, bad, bad, I, I do have to put my hands up and say, unfortunately, that, that I, I can't take responsibility <laughs> for that. Have you got any other films in the line? Have you, are you going to sort of try and carry on doing film work? Or? I'd love to. I, I'd love to. I keep my eyes peeled for every opportunity that I can see. And it's groups on Facebook. It's... Uh, agencies that I'm working with, websites that I check. And the thing is, I've got a little six-year-old mm. and he's my priority at the moment. Well, that, that's quite convenient because I was just about to go on to uh, acting, um, acting as being a parent uh, or being parent and child groups. I suppose that's acting in a different form. Yes, that's... Well, that's the... That's what's keeping us afloat at the moment. That's what's keeping us going. And it's a group. We do a group called Boogie Tots. Um, we take it into schools and we run it locally in March and um, Wisbeach. Mm-hmm. And it was my wife's idea. When our little one was one, we didn't want to take him to. Well, we took him to some toddler groups, but th- there was a waiting list. And then when we got into them, he go off and play with toys and then we'd just be sat there. We'd just be sat there for an hour and we, we want to interact with him. We want to enjoy every little bit we could with him. Mm. So Sarah decided that she she thought she'd run her own group. And the idea is that you get to sing along with songs, you get to dance with them, we play instruments, we get parachutes out. And it, it's all about being active and interacting with your little ones. It helps them learn. All of this. And so for the last three, four years now, I think, we've been running Boogie Tots. And it's it's good fun. It's nice. We've, Like I say, we've been able to take it to schools. Um, we do groups in Wisbeach and, and March. So we, we've done groups further afield. But unfortunately, it, you've got to, you've got to keep, the interest mm. there. And as kids grow up, sometimes there's not another lot of gr- kids following yeah. up. But yeah, with, with Speech and March, there there just seems to be a constant knowledge of the group and it keeps regenerating, which is really nice. I, I guess, obviously, just talking about the dirty word COVID, I'm guessing that's had a, a massive impact on on things like that for the last couple of years. Yes, it has. The, it, the March group has struggled uh, since we've come back from covid um we came back when the schools came back in september and the march group just hasn't got going unfortunately the right. wisbeach group has taken off the wisbeach group is running nicely we get about 20 to 25 children each week but the march group sometimes it has seven sometimes it has four sometimes it has 13 Sometimes it doesn't have any. Yeah, I suppose there's an awful lot of um, confidence just, yeah. in trying to get people back out again. I suppose with, you know, we're, we're, as we're talking, we've got the new um, Om- Omicron version variant of the of COVID as well, and that's having a, a big impact. And I can we can see us sort of going back into another 
lockdown oh, or something, please, something, uh, I, something you've been through. So yeah, I can imagine it's it's quite um, a, a, a taut time for you. It's it's worrying because of course with boogie tots being one thing that we do, we've also got the children's parties, the entertainment, which is the other side of things that we do. Mm. Because I do magic shows and balloon modelling and all this sort sort of but stuff. But it's all the entertainment gig stuff, and it's which all is all the entertainment gigs, which people are just so unsure whether to go for and book. And of course, if there is going to be what talk of another lockdown, people aren't going to book. And yeah, it's, it, it's, it makes we were just kind difficult. of just getting the confidence back where everything had opened up and people, theatres and shows and. Um, performers and events were just beginning to get back on track again yeah and, and now all of a sudden it's all been kicked at, or it, it could potentially be kicked into touch in the next week or so it's it's not good because in general the arts they it struggles to get going again yes you've got your performers that could do it in their homes mm. and you saw from all the live streams all these Virtual chats, the... Shows from car parks. <laughs> Zoom and all this sort of stuff. But to get a professional show up and running, it's rehearsal. Yeah. It's months of rehearsal. And if you can't have that rehearsal... Yeah. Then you need the one show to lead into the next show to lead into the next show. If you if you stop that chain... Yeah. Then all of a sudden, to get the ball rolling again, to get get things moving again, it's... Yeah, I mean, difficult. I mean, yes, my my work is slightly different, but I find that a lot of my follow on work is all you you do one job, and that makes contacts for another job, and a lot of it is word of mouth and just being present and seeing and and all association. So I can imagine you have the same kind of thing. You have one event and the next one, so you've got to have that chain where yeah. you have the start and then the next one and the next exactly. one. Exactly, people need to see what you can do to know what you can do yeah you you could put up as many videos of it as you like but without people actually seeing it and engaging and being part of it exactly and actually being able to talk to you because yeah. part part of my job is my personality i've not got one but i've got to pretend to have one <laughs> when people meet me it's just part and parcel of it but it's that experience yeah it's that interaction and experience and, and being part of it yeah. that, that has a, a, a is big like say big difference than watching it on a, on a video which has either been edited or just you don't get that kind of exactly and i i'm not very good at zoom parties i did a few last year and i just don't feel like i don't think anybody it, does though i, think I, it's, I just it's don't feel you... like i was able to carry across my show and my style mm. across a video especially when you talk when people you don't know whether to mute everybody that's on there mm. and just perform at the screen or, or whether to the leave them sound. there and be able to interact with them yeah and it it just makes it yeah very difficult very very difficult i think there is there is another way around that but that's more needing a, a tech person as a side to sort of be an interface between <laughs> the audience and the... Because I think it works on things like um, Mock the Week and stuff. So you have the presenter and then you have all the, the people at home watching. Yeah. But they respond. But you have someone in between to moderate sort the noise and the volumes and stuff. So it, you, you a hear... A slight delay. And, yeah. yeah. So I suppose it is possible. I think it's just it's how it's managed. But if you if you're doing the show yourself, you, you don't have that option. No, you've you just got to put yourself out there and hope it goes well. We've talked about radio. We've talked about presenting. We've talked about um, shows and performing. Um, you, you've done a bit of singing. I you sound so questionable there, David. <laughs> I do. I, I haven't I, heard you sing. I don't think I, I don't think I heard you sing. Count yourself lucky. <laughs> um, no. I do, I do sing. Uh, I've got an Elvis cabaret. Mm -hmm. uh, I sing some Elvis songs and I also sing various other artists. And I go around social clubs performing my little sets, whether it's two one hours or three half an hours, whatever, just to entertain people. Do you, do you have sideburns? 
Stick on sideburns too. No, there's an idea. It's one of those things where I don't like Elvis. When I was a kid, when I was a kid and we were on holiday, I and a, a cabaret would come on and sing Elvis, I'd leave the building. Yeah. <laughs> Quite literally. And now I'm here earning a living singing King. as Elvis. It, yeah. And the only way I can do that is just to have fun. Yeah. And just... Just, just take it as it is. Just go as it comes. Yeah. I. There's no point in turning around and saying that I can replace him. There's no, I'm not the best. I'm not the worst. But I make sure everyone has a good time. Yeah. You've come to Fenland. Yeah. What do you feel you have got from being in Fenland? And this will lead into another question that I'm about to ask. But, okay. but just, you've, you've come here, you've, got a, you've had a lot of opportunities. Even considering that this is a place where it's supposed to be very deprived in a lot of arts, culture, media, but you've managed to to make a career out in into arts, yeah, theatre, music, dance, performance, and so you've you've so people can have quite a negative view of of Finland and so, because it's so r- remote and r- rural, but you've seen that as an opportunity to go forward. Yeah, because they. There is a lot of talent in Fenland. There's a lot of opportunities in Fenland. The, uh, if you look from Whittlesea at the Straw Bear, Chatteris Summer Festival, March Summer Festival, Wiz Beach Rock in the Fu- Park, um, Wiz Beach Day, St George's Day, March Christmas, there are events. Yeah. And that that's what I saw as my window in. Once I got into that one event, suddenly this entire thing exploded. And I'm, it was like a, like one of them sling ring portals from Doctor Strange. Mm. You'd, it, before I could just see the road. All of a sudden, this big old portal opened and I could see a completely different picture. Yeah. And there is so much avenues for entertainment. And the arts. I've started a group uh, a while back now called the Fenland Entertainment Network. And if anybody wants to join, that wants to do arts in the Fenland, whether you're a magician, a musician, singer, a painter, director, writer, comedian, artist, however you're involved in the creative arts, please feel free to join the site because it's about creating a network Mm. it's about helping each other it's about if we if you've got a gig and that you can't make and you need cover you know that there's going to be someone local that's talented on that site if you if you're putting on events and you need your performers Mm. Whatever it is, if you're putting on a art exhibition and you're struggling to find artists, go on the page. There, yeah. There's going to be artists on the page that can be there. And it, the idea is that here we've got such a great wealth of talent. Yeah. Such a massive wealth, but everyone just seems to be... They hide. Dotted and hidden. Yeah. And the idea of this page is that it can, you can hide all together. Yeah. <laughs> you can hide in a group. You can, um, but in that group, then you've got a chance to put your hand up and be seen if you want to. Yeah. Pass on your knowledge. Pass on your experience. Help others out. Publicize your. If if you've, if you're a teenager that's just recorded a song that they've put up on SoundCloud, put it there. Yeah. Let let somebody else hear it. If you're a writer that. Is right. You can write songs. You just can't sing them. Mm. Get that. Get yourself out there. Use that as your little, that little foothold. Whether whether you're fifty or fifteen, it, it's just that little step forwards. Yeah. Which I, I've I've made it. We've got ninety three people on there. <laughs> it's it's not massive, but it's there. And yeah. if people want to use it, they can. So you can go and have a look if you if you want. Yeah. Um, 
Now, the reason why I was asking that is you obviously, Fennan now means a lot to you. So you've obviously decided to take things further and go into become a counsellor. Yes, I'm a March town counsellor, believe it or not. Um, so what made you decide to go into that? Because uh, a while back there was an article saying that Fenland is the most uh, depressed area in the country. Um, it, and I've also, through my work with 2020 and other arts agencies, have found that engagement in the arts was very, very low. Hmm. And I wanted to help with that. And the best way to help with that isn't to shout about it on Facebook. Why is this not on? Why is that not on? Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? Why have they cancelled this? The Shouting about it on Facebook will only go so far. Yeah. So I thought, well, if I want to do something about it, I may as well do something about it. Yeah. So I signed up, I became a counsellor. And the idea is that I'm there to support the arts, champion the arts. If there's something put forward to the council, then I can encourage it, mm. work with it. I'm on the Christmas Lights Committee, the Summer Festival Committee, the St George's Day Committee, <laughs> the Christmas Market, anything to do with the arts. I, I will be involved to help push forward. So, if I want to uh, want funding, do I come and see you? <laughs> yeah, just give me a shout. You let me know what it is, and even even if I can't get it that way, I could point in the direction. Point you because some people don't even know where to start. No, um, it's, I mean, Fennan District Council is quite a big organisation, and there's lots and lots of, lot of di- di- departments, and that's massively. sort of and that's sort of on top of all the the towns that have their own councils exactly so it's, it's quite a myriad of, of different departments so it's it's a maze of one thing and another and to get to just be able to get in contact with someone who can say right so you you want to put on a play right well this grant might be able to help you you need to apply to Fenland district council this bit or cambridge county council this bit mm. or have a word with your local mayor they might be able to do it in their mayoral funding because with they have tons, their own, they have their own pots don't they yeah the, they have their charity pots and Wisbeach uh helped us out as boogie tots mm. um steve tierney when he was mayor he granted us a little bit of money which just kept us afloat when we just started out it helped us invest in the bits that we needed to keep moving forward. Yeah. And that's what I want to do. I want to help people keep moving forward. You're kind of giving back or at least helping others. Trying to. Trying to. What's next for, you know, we've, we've, you've done counselling, you've been in film, you've done, uh, oh, your book. You know, we haven't talked about your book yet. My book? Yeah, do you want to just mention a little bit about your book? <laughs> okay, so... Um, my book, uh, Jordan and Bear's Hospital Adventures, mm-hmm. um, is a series based on my eldest son went into Great Ormond Street when he was 16. Mm-hmm. He had a heart transplant. Um, they saved his life. Um, while he was in Great Ormond Street, he, he's he got a very he, active imagination. Mm. And he came up with all these characters um, just to keep himself entertained while he was there. Uh, the bin man that came in, uh, he he remembered him. He remembered that there was a very tall janitor and who he called Giraffe Man and so on and so forth. And he, he was the first person that had a Big Mac in the intensive care unit. <laughs> Great Ormond Street. And these st- stories, they, I was there and I was thinking, well, hold on a minute. That He then went on to become an entertainment manager. He lived his dream of being an entertainer. 
And I thought, well, could these stories help people who are ill in hospital? Mm. Could could they um, just give them that little bit of comfort that someone who had a heart transplant at 15, 16... Yeah, which is now quite, quite a traumatic and scary place to be. Massive thing that he did. He had three major surgeries in the space of 24 hours. Um, and... So he went on to live his life and achieve his dream. Mm. And so if that can just provide hope to one other child, yeah, then that that would be brilliant. So I've I've wrote these stories down. And Jordan and Bears has been released. It's on Amazon. Um if people wanna have a look, they're more than welcome. I do try and make a donation to Great Ormond Street for every book that is sold. Yeah. Because they they saved his life. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, in November of 2021. Yeah. And he had extra years that he wouldn't have got without that hospital. So the book is to make is my way of being able to contribute to the hospital long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a series of them, so hopefully I'll be able to get more of them out and maybe get more young artists involved in doing the illustrations in the books. Yep. And that it's it's all about his inspiration and his journey. And it's a nice way of... I hope to be able to continue a legacy for him now. I was going to say, it sounds like a lovely legacy to remember him by. Yeah, I, I hope so. I I don't have the uh, writing skills of yourself, but I, I do aim to do my best. I'm sure it'll be received well. And it'll do good for, for St Ormond Street, Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital as well. Yeah. Well, that's... Every Every bit helps. Definitely. We need to end on a cheerier note than that, David. We will. And I was just about to say, what's what's the future for, for Gary? The future? Um, at the moment, we want to see if we can take Boogie Tots into more schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love the interaction with the children. We love seeing how they enjoy it. And we love seeing how they learn from it and engage with us. I now walk around uh, my son's school and the kids know who I am Mm. and they shout at me (laughs) silly Gary stupid Gary because that's all Sarah keeps getting them to shout at me is silly Gary and it's wonderful yeah to see that they've taken us in yeah they know who we are and so we want to try and take boogie tots into more schools help more children uh I'd want to get taking my cabarets to from social clubs to holiday parks i have an affinity with holiday parks and i hope to one day end up back as an entertainment manager in a holiday park maybe in america if anybody's interested (laughs) in investing just give me a shout um worth a plug you never know yeah um but but that's a long way down the road i'd like to take my cabaret into holiday parks and entertain from there and see how that goes. And if there's a chance, I'm always, always just got that little ear out for a radio job that's full time or a TV job, some, some acting job somewhere or a voiceover job. I, I'm thinking of getting into audiobooks. Mm-hmm. I, I'd like to uh, narrate audiobooks, I think. My voice is annoying enough to be playing on someone's car on long car journeys. <laughs> well, you're competing with things people like uh, Stephen Fry, you know, uh, oh. and uh, was it J- um, David Jason? Yes, uh, I don't uh, think David, I'll David ever... Tennant as well. He's he's, he's, he's doing very well with it. But then, of course, you've got smaller books mm. that don't have the big names attached to them that I might be able to have a go at and I, it's an avenue that I will be looking into more and more as my son grows up he's mm. six now 
So my, as my youngest grows up and gets more independent and that free Freeze time, more time comes in, I can then start looking into those avenues more in depth. Yeah. Definitely. Well, well I wish you all the best. Well, thank you. Well, I think that's a good place to, to bring bring this to a close. Thank you very much for, for my guest, Gary Tustin. Thank you for, for spending this hour with us. Um, yeah, I think it is about an hour for a change. Hey, <laughs> oh, you, you know me, my, the, I can't ever shut up. That's the thing. Well, my chat hours are never really an hour. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an hour in a loose sense of terms. But thank you very much for, for giving me time and talking about some amazing things and some personal things as well. We appreciate you, you, you talking. And uh, look forward to always listening out to, to see what you, you're doing next. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.